right, welcome to the Jeff Hagee Show. I'm excited today to have Whitney Johnson with me. I'm going to give you a bit of a brief bio, but I'm going to let her tell a little bit more about herself. She's the CEO of Dis- Disruption Advisors and one of the 10 leading business thinkers in the world is named by Thinkers 50, an expert at helping leaders grow their people and grow their organization. Whitney's an award-winning author, world-class keynote speaker, free- frequent lecturer for Harvard Business School's corporate learning, and an executive coach and advisor to CEOs. Whitney, I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with me. Um, take a little more time to Tell more about yourself. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Jeff. Um, hmm, what else shall I tell you? I, I guess um, in the spirit of a conversation around growth and change and disrupting yourself, I will share with you that I studied music in college. And um, after graduating from college, my husband and I went to New York. And yes, I got married in, in college. And uh, he was studying to get his PhD at Columbia and we needed to put food on the table. The person who was designated to get that food was me. And so with my music major, I got a job as a secretary working for a wall street broker. And I, 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 at this point didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just knew that I needed to earn money, but in, in, in our office, there was a, a bullpen of young stockbrokers, all male, who were saying things like, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know this is a good idea to open your account or to buy the stock and throw down your pom-poms and get in the game. And at first I was a little bit offended because I was a cheerleader in high school, but after hearing them say that over and over and over again, I realized it was time for me to throw down my pom-poms and I wouldn't have known this to uh, known it to call the, it this then, but this was really the beginning of me disrupting myself, disrupting what I saw as a possibility for me. Up until that time, I had some vague notion of what my life was going to be like. And I started to have this idea of, oh, I can have a career and I can do this really interesting Wall Street thing. And so that's that's the beginning of, of my my professional path. And I guess a couple of other things to share with you is, and we can talk more about the work that I did with Clayton Christensen, if you like, Uh, but we now live in Virginia. My husband teaches at Southern Virginia University. We have two children who are college age, and I am the CEO and president or CEO and founder, I should say, of Disruption Advisors, where we help um, companies figure out how to grow their people so that they can grow their company. That's awesome. So, now that's got me curious. First of all, where did you go to college? I went to Brigham Young University. Okay. So that's that does have me curious because I didn't know that was the path you had taken. So mm-hmm. as one of your mentors, how did you and Clayton Christensen connect? Oh, yeah. So um, it, this is a great story. So I, um, as I said, I started working on Wall Street and I was, I started as a secretary and then eventually became an investment banker. And if you worked in financial services, you know, that does not happen. Um, then I became an equity research analyst and I was covering emerging markets where it was my job to pick stocks, to put a buy and a sell on stocks. And this is now um, probably 2003, 2004. And um I read The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. I also hear him speak at a a church meeting. And so I'm like really intrigued by who is this man? I've never heard of him. And he's just fascinating. And when I read The Innovator's Dilemma, I had this thought of, oh, this helps me understand what's going on in the emerging markets. Um, Wireless telephony is disrupting wireline real time. And that's why every quarter when I'm building my financial models and I'm they're beating my numbers every quarter, that's what's happening. There's disruption taking place. But then as I read his work, I realized, oh, disruption isn't just about products. It's also about people. And that was a big aha for me. Well, about, I don't know, a couple of years later, I had gone to my boss and said, hey, I really want to do something more. I think there's something more for me. And they said, we like you right where you are. And now I've read Innovator's Dilemma and I have this thought of actually it is about people. And so I disrupted myself and I left Wall Street. We were now living in Boston and my husband had taken a teaching position there. And so I uh, connected with Clayton through a number of church projects And um, after working with him on those with public affairs, he was starting an investment fund 
with his son. And he asked me, because I had a Wall Street background, if I would be a co-founder of the Disruptive Innovation Fund with him. So I discovered his work and then had this wonderful privilege of getting to work with him for the better part of a decade. Are you an entrepreneur who wants to discover the breakthrough secrets that will produce the results you've been searching for, but you just can't seem to figure out why you keep working harder and harder and you're just not getting those results? I want to tell you about a new challenge that I've created just for you, the Business Domination Challenge. If you want to create the entrepreneurial lifestyle and the business you dream of, then this is exactly what you're looking for. I created the Business Domination Challenge to show you how to grow your business exponentially and to become an optimal performing entrepreneur. What's an optimal performing entrepreneur? It's an entrepreneur who's succeeding in all areas of their life. If I show you how to build a successful business, but your relationships, your health, and everything else is falling apart, that's not a success. It's not about working harder, it's about implementing the correct principles and becoming the person who can do the things that produce the results. Hurry and go to jeffhagey.com slash business domination and secure your spot today. Okay. That is that is very cool. Cool story. I I did have the opportunity to meet him once in Calgary. He was mm-hmm. up there speaking and yeah, that was a great opportunity to go listen to him and have the opportunity to meet him. Um, so let's continue with disruption for a bit. Um, and we are going to, I do want to get into your newest book, um, Smart Growth. Mm-hmm. And in there, that's one thing as you're talking, I thought of something that you said in there that companies don't disrupt people do. And so I do want to go more on that, but just what is disruption? Yeah. Yeah. Because you think about disruption, you're like, Oh, the kid that's disrupting in school. Um, And, and I mean it in a very positive sense and as did Clayton, but the, the definition of disruptive innovation is it's a silly little thing that ends up taking over the world. Like, the telephone did to the telegraph, like the automobile did to the horse and buggy. More recently, we've seen Netflix disrupt Blockbuster, now cable TV, Uber disrupting cabs. And so a silly little thing that takes over the world. Well, the aha that I had was that disruption wasn't just about products. As I said, it was also about people. And so the the big difference, though, with personal disruption is that you're Netflix and your Blockbuster, you're you're, um, Uber and your cabs. Um, You're the silly little thing and you're taking over the world because you are disrupting you, you're disrupting yourself, you're David and your Goliath. Uh, A a simple example of this, because everybody will know her is Lady Gaga. So Lady Gaga, she 2008, she um, goes straight to the top of the charts and um, the pop charts. And what does she do for an encore? She collaborates with Tony Bennett on a jazz album. She uh, does a Sound of Music tribute at the Oscars. And then she produces a country album and all three of these genres could have completely put off her fan base. But this bet, this disrupting of herself, it paid off because her performance at the Super Bowl in 2017 had the largest music audience ever. So that's personal disruption where you are disrupting yourself. And to to your question about companies don't disrupt, people do. If you as an individual, if you as a CEO, if you as as a CFO, if you as a a frontline worker, if you are not disrupting yourself, if you are not growing, then how will your company ever grow? Like the, The company disrupts, but it's disrupting because you yourself are disrupting yourself. And so when we're doing that, how do people find that? opportunity to disrupt how do they know what to do because i mean one of the other things i know that you talk about is grow yourself grow your people grow your company and yeah so it's, it's got to start with yourself that's right how do you find that self how, how does that what does that look like well um so I, l- let me start with this idea of how do you know when it's time to disrupt yourself Um, sometimes we're forced to disrupt. I think that's one of the gifts of the pandemic. Um, it it pushed all of us into this new place, but one of the ways that, you know, when it's time to do something new, um, is you, you find yourself saying things like, um, that's not how we do it here. Um, you find yourself kind of dialing it in somewhat bored. You find yourself envious of other people who are growing and learning and developing, 
But the, the biggest way that you know that it's time for you to do something new is when you find yourself saying, I feel like there's something more. I can just feel it. And if I don't do something new, I will die inside a little. And so those are all signals for you that it's time to disrupt yourself. It's time to step back from who you are to slingshot into who you can be. And I talk about this in my book, Disrupt Yourself, and how, okay, once you know, okay, this is the mechanism, disruption is the mechanism of personal growth and development. I talk about seven accelerants that will allow you to grow, that will allow you to disrupt yourself. And I can talk through those, but that that gives you a, a, an introduction to the idea. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would love to um, get into that because just for my own sake, I actually have those notes on those seven right in front of me. So let's let's talk about that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it, there's, there are seven accelerants and um, let's, again, we're talking about you as an individual, but you can toggle back and forth and you can think about this from a company perspective as well. But the first is to take the right kinds of risks. And um, when you think about disruption, there are two kinds of risks. There's competitive risk and there's market risk. And so competitive risk would be there's a big job. There's a huge opportunity. Um, you just have to figure out if you can compete and win. So you see a job posting, let's say it's on LinkedIn. And you're like, yeah, you know what? I can compete. I can win. I'm going to go for it. Um, market risk, and this is where disruption comes in, is you don't know if there's a job, you don't know if there's an opportunity, but if you can create the job, because you know there's a problem that needs to be solved, if you can create it, if you can persuade people to hire you to do this, then there won't be competition, there won't be 50 applicants, there will be you. And what we know from the theory of that's taking on market risk, you're creating a new market. And what we know from the theory of disruption is that when you take on market risk versus competitive risk, your odds of success are six times higher and your revenue opportunity 20 times greater. And so um, it's never that clear cut, but as you're thinking about your career, as you're thinking about your life, you want to think about how can I focus on taking on market risk? How can I have in my head, um, I'm going to create versus compete? Um, there's this wonderful saying is that amateurs um, compete and professionals create. And so as you're thinking about disrupting yourself, if you want to have as high of a return on investment as possible, you want to look for opportunities to take on market risk, opportunities to play where you haven't played before, where others haven't played before. So that's number one is to take the right risks. That's excellent. And yeah, that's just, I, I love looking at that from the standpoint of the market risk. I haven't heard those stats before, but mm. what what an opportunity if you're willing to take that risk. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And 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 it still may, may not work, but your odds are so much higher. And, and there's always a continuum. We're, we're going to take on a lot of competitive risk, but the more you can think of like, where can I play that no one else is playing? Where can I play that I haven't played before? That's where your opportunity is. Right. Uh, All right. So should I go to number, should I go to number two or do you want to reflect? Okay. All right. So number two is uh, to play to your distinctive strengths. And so you, you want to play to your strengths, but you also want to play to what you do well and what you do uniquely well. So a great example of this is the koala. Um, The koala, it has a distinctive strength. What is its distinctive strength? Well, let me tell you. So it sleeps up to 20 hours a day. So you think, how does the koala survive if it's sleeping all the time? Well, it survives because it eats something that pretty much no other animal and no other human can eat. And those are eucalyptus leaves. And because only it can eat them, then it can survive sleeping 20 hours a day because it has a distinctive strength. And so as you're thinking about how do I disrupt myself, how do I play where no one else is playing, if you can focus on what you do uniquely and idiosyncratically well, then you're going to feel strong. And if you feel strong, then you're willing to play where you haven't played before. Let me give you two hints to think about how do you know what your strengths are. Number one is to think about what exasperates you, meaning when you find yourself saying, everybody knows how to do this. This is just common sense. Like everyone knows how to do this. You're exasperated. That is a clue that you are 
uniquely good at something in a situation because it's so easy for you. It is so reflexive. You can't even fathom that other people don't get how to do it. That is a distinct, that, that is a strength. And then you want to find places where, you know, if you're a great marketer, surround yourself by finance people. And then all of a sudden you're a great marketer in a sea of people who don't know how to market. That's a distinctive strength. The other thing you want to look for is what compliments do you get frequently that you find yourself dismissing? You dismiss them because they're so easy for you. It's not valuable to you. But when people give you a compliment, they're holding up a mirror to you and saying, pay attention. You do this really well. And so that's another way to know what your strength is. And if you are willing to put your strengths in places and deploy them in ways where they're distinctive and then play where other people aren't playing, this becomes a flywheel effect that allows you to grow and develop. And that's part of the equation of disrupting yourself. I love that because it is something that, you know, on a strength like that, it's such a easy way to nonchalant put it off. Mm -hmm. And, and actually, I really like how you put that into context of the flywheel effect. Will you kind of just explain that concept a little bit and what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So the flywheel effect is if you think about, you know, you, you have things, they, they build on each other. So I'm, I'm using my fingers to circle of, of you have one thing and then it pushes it forward. So, so if you think about this idea of if I've got a strength and I'm will, then um, Marcus Bank Buckingham said that our strengths clamor for our attention in the most basic way because using them helps us feel strong. So when you have this strength, you feel strong. And when you feel strong, then you're willing to play where other people haven't played. Think about an explorer. You're willing to venture forth because you feel like I can do this. And then we know from an evolutionary perspective that fortune favors the, the, the brave. Fortune favors the people who are willing to go, go and explore, that are willing to play where no one else is playing. And so then as you explore and play where no one else is playing, then you're going to get even stronger. You're going to discover more than what you do well. Your unique advantages start to accumulate, and then you're able to play where other people haven't played before even more. And so they build on each other and reinforce each other. That's great. And then with that momentum, you become unstoppable with it. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Now, again, here's the thing about strengths is, is we talk about strengths of like, oh, it's so obvious, but because it's reflexive, because it's reflexive, it's very easy to completely undervalue it. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example. I remember earlier in my career, people would say to me, oh, well, you're really good at, at building relationships with CEOs. And they almost said it like as if you're a successful equity analyst only because you can build relationships, not because you can build a financial model or you can pick a stock, just because you can build relationships. It wasn't that I couldn't do all those other things, but because I was so good at building relationships, I didn't value it. And so I thought that they were somehow dismissing me. So the thing that I want everybody who's listening to remember is it could be that whatever you do well, you don't actually value. And if you want to really make an outsized contribution in the world, it's important to start valuing the things that you do in a magnificent, unusual, idiosyncratic way. Awesome. Thank you. So then we would move on to constraints. Yeah. All right. So here you are you're climbing a mountain um, of, of growth and we're going to come to the S curve in a minute, but you're sort of growing and developing and you, you're, you're playing to your strengths and you're playing where you haven't played before. And now the tendency is to say, if only, if only I had more time, if only I had more money, if only I had more buy-in from my colleagues, then, then I could be successful. And what we know from the law of physics is that you need friction. You need something to bump up against in order to build momentum. And so when I talk about embracing constraints, I encourage you, well, let me give you an example. Skateboarders are some of the quickest learners in the world. Why are they quick learners? Because every action, every move has immediate feedback. They know exactly what works and exactly what doesn't. So those constraints give them feedback. And so as you're thinking about disrupting yourself and doing something different, ask yourself, what don't I have enough of? 
enough time, enough money, enough resources generally? How is it possible that whatever I don't have enough of is actually a tool of creation? Because we know we need constraints to build momentum. So embrace your constraints because it could be that what you think you don't have enough of is the very thing you need in order to build momentum as you play where you haven't played before. And so looking at that, how do, how do we, because a lot of those things, we just look at it as such a negative and we can't mm-hmm. step back and look at, look at it from that perspective. How, how do you advise people to make sure they're looking at it from that perspective? Yeah. So, so building on what I just said is, is this idea of being able to say to yourself, okay, um, if I don't have enough of this, so let me give you an example. I was having a conversation with someone the other day. So young entrepreneur looking for a new job um, is great from a photography standpoint, but needs to do get updated on, on videography. And she was saying to me, I don't have the cash. I don't have the money to do this. And so if, if only I could get more cash in order to get the equipment that I need and get the training that I need. And so my comment to her was, okay, let's just imagine for a moment that you are 15 years old and you live in an emerging market and you don't have any money. Like literally the only way you're going to be able to take this picture is if you figure out a way to do it with what you have on hand, what would you do? And so then she started thinking about it. She goes, well, I would use my phone and then I would do X, Y, and Z. And she figured out a way to get what she needed with probably less than $1,500, not the thousands and thousands of dollars that she needed. And so basically what I do when they're in that situation is I say to them, if you had to do this with what you have on hand, like there is no other way out, or if you were 15 years old in any emerging markets, what would you do? And when you start to give people that constraint, then their brain starts to go, it starts to go down a different track. And that's where the innovation takes place. And so use this thing that you don't have enough of to innovate and think differently. And, and if you look at, um, if you look at so often the contributions that we've made in our lives are because we didn't have enough of something and we figured out how to innovate around it. I mean, I'm a music major and you think about, right. well, I figured out, well, okay. So I didn't take finance courses in, initially, but how did I use the fact that I knew music to innovate? Right. Which by the way, so I don't leave an open loop is that I see structure because of music. It helps me see structure. It helps me see, um, how to, you know, I played sonatas and concertos. Okay, there's a beginning, there's a middle and end. So that helps me structure a research report. And so you find different ways to build on this thing that you don't have enough of that makes you unique and differentiates you. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like a lot of these things are just teaching or training ourselves to think differently. Right. Right. I love that. Okay. Yeah. Is anything coming to mind for you? I don't know. It's it's actually as you're talking, my my thoughts are going in a million different directions, uh-huh. and and I love it. It's it's just like okay, yeah, I can see that. Where not nothing specific, I can just point mm-hmm. out, but but yes, yeah, okay, so. okay. All right, should I go to number four? Yeah, so let's go to the next one. Yes. Okay, so you've got number one, which is take the right risk. Number two, which is play to your distinctive strengths. Number three is embrace your constraints. Number four is examine your expectations. And what do I mean by that? Well, oftentimes when we get stuck or stalled when we're trying to grow, it's because we say to ourselves, things should be different. They should be like this. They should be different than, than what they are. And when we, when we start using the word should, what happens is we become a victim and when we become a victim, then we stop figuring out, okay, well, I've got this constraint. What am I going to do with this? Um, and so if we can examine our expectations and say, okay, am I doing that right now? Or am I going to just say, well, here's what I've got. Like, this is what I've got. 
And I'm going to close the gap between my reality and expectations. I'm going to figure out how to act and not be acted upon. I'm going to figure out how to take this thing that I don't have enough of, turn it into a tool of creation. And so when you can examine your expectations, if you find that you're saying the word should a lot, that's usually an indication that you've stalled and you want to flip that switch and go back to, okay, what am I going to do this? How am I going to turn? How am I going to be, uh, become a professional and create and stop being an amateur and competing with the situations as they stand? Uh, so when, when we're looking at that, You, you, you've got me thinking a lot. I love this. <laughs> so, cause I think we, we see this a lot with, you know, people like coach saying I should be doing X, Y, Z. And it really gives me a reflection on, yeah. Okay. Now we need to take another step back. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, so yeah, when we say should, it's like, okay, so, so what do we expect it to be? What, is it, and then how do we move our uh, move our viewpoint away from what we expect to what is? So now, what do we want to do next? And getting getting ourselves to focus there, it, it makes a big difference. And that's that's how we're going to move forward. And and we all had an experience of doing that with the pandemic, right? right. Things should be different. They life shouldn't be like this. And 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 what pretty much all of us had to do beginning in March of 2020 is say, but they're not different. So what do I want to do? Do I want to be afraid? Or do I want to say, this is, this is what we've got. What am I going to learn from this? What am I going to do with this? What am I, no matter how hard this gets, what will I do next? Right. And cause I did a lot of people just froze. Mm -hmm. And I talked with a lot of people is, you know, yeah, there's a lot of things that should be different. We mm -hmm. want different, mm -hmm. but they're not. So let's find the opportunities because right. there, there was a lot. That's and right. It continues to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think we all froze for a while. I know I had, I had, I thought I froze for two days. My children tell me I froze for two weeks, just to be clear, <laughs> just for the record. Um, but I, I do remember making a very, very clear decision of, okay, what am I going to do here? Am I going to succumb to fear and, you know, uh, being distraught? Or am I going to just say, okay, I, I'm going to move forward. And, and one of the big consequences of this, this is like a clear thing, is I started to do a LinkedIn Live every day for 13 days straight as my way of saying I am not going to give into this. This is how I'm going to, to serve and, and move forward. And I think we all, most of us had something that we did. And the exciting thing is here's what psychologists say, is that a period of severe stress, like a pandemic, often leads to tremendous growth. They call it post-traumatic growth. So we're now moving into this period where there is going to be tremendous growth, I think, personally, professionally, and globally because of what we learned during this, this time period. Absolutely. I, I remember the first time I walked into the grocery store and the shelves were empty mm. and it started, you know, you started having the lineups at the store and all that sort of stuff. And that's, I talked with some of my clients. It's if you don't start taking some action now, when things open up again, that's what it's going to be like. We're all yeah. lined up. Ooh. And by, by the time you get there, the shelves are empty. Great. So, Mm. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. There, and I mean, you look at the De Great Depression, any of those, there were so many great opportunities that followed. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So that's examining expectations is, is to focus on, okay. Amateurs compete, professionals create with what is, and just close the gap and, you know, mind the gap as they say in, in London or in, yeah. in the Okay. Okay. So that's number four. Number five is step back to grow, step back to slingshot forward. Um, if you look at the theory of disruption, basically what happens if you're, if you've got a piece of graph paper, when you disrupt yourself, you're, you're on the, the Y axis, the vertical line, let's say you're at a 12 and your life is going along and over one, up one, over one, up one. And when you disrupt yourself, what you are doing is you're making a conscious choice to move 
from a 12 on that vertical axis, that Y axis back down to a 10, because you believe that by disrupting yourself, the slope of your line will be steeper. So it'll be over one up three or over one up five. So you step back in order to slingshot forward. And, you know, you do that if you own a business, you invest cash because you think there'll be a return on that investment. But almost always when people make a decision to disrupt themselves and we look at it and we think, why are you doing that? Are you out of your mind? It's because they believe that in the future, they will be happier. They will be more successful by stepping back from who they are and how they are today. Do you find that that can be difficult for people to do, take that step? Oh yeah. Super yeah. difficult. And it's called the ego. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. It's called the ego, right? Because if you think about it, so I'm working on wall street, right? I've got a good salary. I've got a good title and I go into my boss and I say, Hey, I'm going to leave. And I didn't have anything I knew I was going to do. And she said to me, why would you walk away from all of this? Basically, have you lost your mind? And, um, and so, yeah, because you're walking away from a paycheck, you're walking away from a certain level of status to go be a beginner again, to do something that you don't know if it's going to work. And so um, when personal disruption happens, oftentimes people don't understand. And the reason they don't understand is because even though the functional job of like, I'm making money is working. There's an emotional job that's not happening. Like I can't keep doing this or I'll die inside a little bit. And so you make that decision to disrupt yourself because you believe that in the future, you will be more successful. However you define success. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a challenge, but it, it's, I like the, I like the visualization of it as slingshot and forward. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And you do it all the time. Like if you think about it, you bring a fist back to punch, like you crouch right. or you jump, like if you're dancing and you're doing the cha-cha, we, we step back to slingshot forward all the time. Okay. Number six. So number six is to give failure its due, which is basically the idea of we all fail. Um, and so fails, failure is not actually the problem. Um, it's, it's the shame that we attach to the failure. And so what we want to do is think about how do we do the inner work so that we feel less shame when we make mistakes and recognize is that failure just means that we're learning. Um, and how do we turn failure and mistakes in their, their constraints and how do we turn them into tools of creation? So again, the failure can propel us forward and the failure actually is not the problem. It's the shame that limits disruption. So separate the two out, do the inner work you need to do around shame so that you can do lots and lots of failures so you can learn faster so that you can grow faster, which is and, really hard by the way. Right. So talk yeah. a little bit, you, you talk about the powerful truths and lies. I like how you talk about that with. Yeah. The powerful failures. truths and lies. Yeah. Um, when did I say that? That's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 I read it somewhere. You had talked okay. about the part that I liked is the lie is that by the, by the time we hear the story, the pain and shame associated has diminished. And so yeah. okay. that part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, here, here's what I would say. There's, So a couple of, of failures for me that kind of build on this idea is, you know, like I could think about an experience that I had, I don't know, five or six years ago where I was speaking and they didn't like it. They hated it. And, um, you know, I thought, well, what, what am I going to do with this? Is this going to be the thing that makes me say I'm going to stop speaking in public or I'm going to, you know, and that would be the lie that I would tell myself of like, you're not, you can't do this. You can't speak. And instead, so that's the failure and the shame. But instead I said, no, I actually, this is important to me. I want to figure out how to do this and I want to do this well. And so it ended up being a galvanizing thing for me. Um, and so I think that that's, that's how we, we want to think about it is, is to say, what do I really want? And how am I going to, to move this forward? I wish I could remember where I said that. That is really good. And I'm, I'm, I think you're making me sound much better than I am. <laughs> you know, when, when I read it, cause what it made, it made me think, of a failure I recently went through that oh. I'm still dealing with 
aftermath of it that it is so hard but I when I think of it in the beginning of when everything first happened Mm -hmm. it was so much more traumatic and it's so much easier for me to kind of look at for lessons now because because of the time that's elapsed and things I mean it's not over so it's still tough Mm -hmm. but still it's you know I guess one of the things about it is we learn so much from our failures, but it still doesn't make failure any fun. (laughs) It's still hard. It still sucks. And (laughs) Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, speaking of which, so I talked about this speaking thing. Um, I, um, another big failure for me was, you know, investing in a business that went totally belly up and, Mm -hmm. you know, thinking, wait, I'm an investor. Like I'm supposed to know how to do this. Like, how did this not work? I must be a fraud. Um, But to your point, um, there were so many important lessons that I learned. Number one of which was I invested in it without really consulting with my husband. Like I kind of did, but not really. And um, he was not bought into this. And so one of the lessons that I learned was you know, it's usually a good idea before jumping headlong into something to consult with your truth tellers. Um, And and it it actually, you know, put a strain on our relationship for, for, you know, a a while. This is, this is a while ago, but um, so the lesson for me out of this was you've got to consult with people, especially people that are going to be affected. Um, And so now I always do. And so that was an important lesson for us. So yes, absolutely. And that's why we have to separate out the shame, because if we have the shame, we're indulging ourselves, and we never get through it, because we just get stuck there over and over again. But when we can separate out the shame, that's when the failure becomes so rich in terms of lessons learned. Was that the magazine? Yes. So our listeners will be able to learn about that more. A story about it in your book. Smart That's Growth. right. That's so, right. That, that was the magazine that I talk about, which by the way, Inside Baseball, I did not have that story in the book until very, very late. And you know why? Because I was like, well, I already learned that lesson. And I had someone, an early reader, read the book. And they said, this book sounds chirpy, which means it's too optimistic. They're like, you have to talk about more mistakes that you've made. So it's like, okay, well, I've got a mistake. How about this one? (laughs) So that story went in there. So just for for your listeners, um, you know, made this investment, we lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, As I said, it was was a strain on my relationship. And so, um, but it was a really good lesson. And as you can tell, I learned a lot. I don't feel shame from it anymore. And so that's the thing. We've got to separate out the two. But yeah, that's, that's, that's where the growth and development comes in is making those mistakes. Absolutely. All right. So do the, the, the very number last seven. one, I'll do it really fast. So number seven is to be driven by discovery. So you take a step forward, you gather feedback and you adapt. And here's what you need to know. 70% of all successful new businesses um, end up in a place completely different from where they started. It will be no different for us. And so Just know that as you're going down this path of disrupting yourself, where you think you're going is probably going to be very different from where you end up. But if you practice these principles, it probably will be even better than what you expected. Absolutely. Because there's so many opportunities, failures, discoveries you're going to make along the way. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, th- this is awesome. I-, I really could sit here all day with you, listening to you tell these stories, but I- I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> um, let's. But before before we wrap things up, I do want to talk a little bit more about smart growth, and if you could c- talk a little bit about the S curve and just yeah. tell at us a high level, there. sure, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that happened, um, Jeff, is that in uh, Disrupt Yourself and Build an A-Team, I had the S-curve. And the S-curve is something that was popularized by the sociologist Everett Rogers like 60 years ago to look at how groups change over time and how ideas are adopted. And this idea was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in The Tipping Point. Um, well, we use the S curve at the Disruptive Innovation Fund for investing, and I had this aha. So, disruption isn't about products; it's about people. I had another aha that the S curve isn't just about how groups change; it's about how people change. 
And so very simply, it is, um, you can draw an S with your finger and there's three major parts to it. There's the launch point where you do something new um, and you feel awkward and gangly and uncomfortable and, and, and growth is happening, but it feels, because you can't see it, it feels very slow. So this is the slow part, this is the launch point of the curve. Then you hit this tipping point if you put in the effort and that's a steep, sleek back part of the curve. And this is where you feel exhilarated, you feel excited and, and, it, and growth is fast and it feels fast, excuse me, and you feel like you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And then you hit this place of mastery and that's the top of the curve. And this is the place where you've figured things out, you've accomplished what you meant to accomplish and because you're no longer um, feeling the, the feel good effects of learning, the growth is slow. So you've got the launch point, sweet spot, mastery. You've got slow and then fast and then slow. And this is a model, this very simple way of thinking about what growth looks like. And you, you can use it for yourself to talk you through whenever you do something new. It helps you understand why you can be good at something and no longer keep doing it because you're not growing and learning anymore. You can use it for personal development and you can use it for developing the people on your team and, and even within your organization. Thank you. And I, I'm going to put in the show notes, I'm going to have the link to all your books. Um, okay. I strongly recommend them to all, all my listeners. Um, there's so much growth you can get out of learning from these books. Um, there is, there's something else I'd like you to touch on just because it's something that's been a real interest to me lately that I've been working in, in the things that I do talking about becoming the person that can do the thing and how that ties in to identity. And in fact, I just was doing a pre-read of Richie Norton's upcoming book and he gave, you were one of the ones that he acknowledged in the back of that book. And I know you talk about identity and identity shift. So can you just talk on that subject a little bit too? Yeah. On identity. Yeah. So whenever you, um, yeah, Richie's new book is really good. So anti, anti time management, uh, shout out to him. So, um, whenever you are at the top of an S curve and you decide that you're going to do something new and you're at the launch point of a new S curve, you are no longer who you were. You have stepped back to slingshot forward. So you're no longer that person, but you've not, you haven't yet slingshotted into who you will be. And so that's this place that feels very uncomfortable and feels very awkward because your identity is in flux. And so what I would say, though, is that once you understand that, once you understand that you're in this place of not yet who you are, who you were, or who you will be, that helps normalize the experience that you're having and the discomfort that you're feeling. So you can talk yourself through it and say, you're going to be okay. You can do this. You're just in this new place. And as we get older, we can really insulate ourselves from ever doing anything new. And so by having this model, it can help you manage through the, the identity shift that's taking place when it's not yet um, established and still in that in-between place. Yeah, thank you. And again, for my listeners, there, there's so much to learn from Whitney and um, we're going to share everywhere. You can follow her and find her website and everything. But there's one other thing, and I just want to pay you credit because this is quite an amazing feat. Um, Marshall Goldsmith, you were selected in 2017, I believe it was, as one of the top 15 coaches out of a pool of over 17,000. Mm. Um, that congratulations on that, and that's just an amazing accomplishment. So, I just wanted to bring that up to I don't know, brag on you to our listeners, <laughs> but it, it's quite amazing. Mm. Um, but yeah, please share with everyone, you know, for anyone that wants to follow you, find out more about you, share where they can connect with you. Um, so I think that there are two easy ways to do that. The first is um, you can uh, newsletter whitneyjohnson.com forward slash newsletter. I, I write, write one every single week. It's very much sort of stories from the trenches of personal disruption. So you'll get lots of personal stories about how I'm applying these ideas. 
And then the second way is to listen to our podcast, the Disrupt Yourself podcast, where um, we um, interview people who are disrupting themselves and, and following their own growth curves. So those are probably the two easiest ways. Excellent. And I'll put the links to both of those in the show notes as well. Mm -hmm. Whitney, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time and the opportunity to talk to you about this and learn more from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to Ryan Godfordson for introducing us. Shout out to Ryan. Absolutely. And he's got a new book coming up soon too. So that'll be great. Hey, athletes and parents of athletes. So much time, money, and effort is put into the physical aspect of your sport to become the best you can be. But the mental game, it's often neglected and it's just as important as the physical game. In fact, it's usually the differentiator between the good and the great athletes. Come and join me in the Confident Athlete Program where you'll learn to control your confidence, develop a powerful mindset, and unlock your full potential. Go to jeffhagey.com slash confident athlete to find out. Some of you may know this, but in addition to my coaching, I've recently joined Geneva Financial Home Loans, a mortgage lender headquartered in Chandler, Arizona as a mortgage loan originator. I've always had a passion for serving others, and now I'm proud to also be a part of Home Loans Powered by Humans. If you're in the state of Arizona and looking to take the next step in your journey, contact me at 801-830-3858 to start the conversation. NMLS number 42056, BK number 0910215, Equal Opportunity Lender.